Hey everyone, so I just wanted to do a really quick video where I go through the layout of the AP exam so that you kind of have an idea of what to expect when you go into it uh, so that you can prepare for it as we get closer to kind of give you an idea of the terminology, how questions are asked, pretty much all the you know pitfalls, all the difficulties that come with this AP exam. Um, so for the most part, this is by far the toughest AP exam. Uh, I don't want to say this to, to scare you and make you think that um, you'll do bad. I just want to give you an idea of uh, where to set your expectations because of the EPs, this test is the toughest and that's sort of reflected in the class. Um, I am going to do my best to make sure that I prepare you for this and to make sure that you're um, you succeed in the class and, and I'll help you out. I'll give you as much resource as I can. But I do want to point out that, you know, it, this is not going to be an easy class to pass because the test itself is tough and this class is modeled after that test. So I want to kind of give you uh, an idea of what make uh, how tough the AP exam is. Again, to put everything into perspective. So these are all the AP exams. Um, I took a bunch of ones that you probably experienced. Um, you can see all the five, four, three, two, one distribution. Um, you can actually see with uh, bio, for example, it has a fairly low percentage. Most of the other ones are double digits with one of them actually going all the way up to 36%. Um, but most of them tend to be, you know, mid 10 to 50, uh, 10 to 20 range piles a little low, but if you look at its uh, percentage of four and three, it ends up balancing out. Uh, over here, the number of people getting above a three, you can see it is for the most part, definitely greater than 50 and typically is gonna be around 70%. And this is true for most of the APs. For AP Physics 1, on the other hand, it's 6% fives, uh, 18 fours, 21 for three, and altogether, 45% of the students pass. Now, one thing I want to point out is when I taught this uh, AP exam, uh, when I taught this AP uh, course at a different school, I regularly doubled the percentages of these numbers. So this 45% for me was much closer to 90% passing. So like I said, this is probably the toughest AP but I will do my best to prepare you for it. Again, I want to get put everything into perspective so that you know what, what you're getting into. Uh, now, why is this AP so tough? What is it about this AP compared to the other ones that makes it tough? And it's because of the fact that the AP focuses on what's called qualitative questioning rather than quantitative questioning. So quantitative is, here are some numbers, calculate the stuff. A lot of calculus questions tend to be like this, or math questions, where they give you numbers, you plug them into an equation, you get an answer. This is something that you would see in like regions physics, for example. Uh, but instead, they're focusing on more qualitative conceptual questions. The idea of what factors affect something. So you're not actually calculating anything. Instead, you're trying to find relationship between things and try to find things like that. Um, I don't think I had it written here, but another thing about this is that a lot of questions tend to be on the trickier side. Um, now all this is actually done, oh, there it is, uh, but all this stuff is actually done to get an idea of making sure uh, that you have a deep understanding of the material. Um, if they just focus on calculation, it's very easy for people to understand how to just do the calculations without understanding why. So that's why they're focusing on the conceptual aspect. Um, now, as I, as I was saying before though, uh, another thing that makes this uh, AP tough is that a lot of the questions tend to be on the trickier side uh, in the sense that they're designed to take advantage of misconceptions uh, and they're designed to kind of point you in the wrong direction. Um, so for example, there's four choices. Uh, they'll give you a question. One of those choices will be pretty much the uh, the immediate response, the response that you know if you just kind of quickly uh, graze through the question uh, and you weren't really paying attention to the question that you would choose and you would think is right. But after rereading it, you would see that it was it's probably something else. 
Uh, so they would always have that one uh, one choice that is always like it could be right but then you have to reread the question and actually go into detail with the question to see that it's actually uh, the wrong choice uh, I'm gonna try to make sure that I uh, again mimic this in the questions that I ask uh, so that you kinda get experience with it now the best way to prepare for this uh, there's actually two ways to prepare um, kind of gets cut off here. One of them is to practice a lot of uh, these types of qualitative questions that are conceptual. Uh, I will point out though that there's not a whole lot out there right now of conceptual questions to kind of practice with. Uh, what we're actually going to be practicing a lot though is quantitative questions. So even though the qualitative questions are where the, the tricky things come from on the AP, uh, you need to have a very intimate knowledge on how the equations work and how, and how calculations work in order to actually understand the concepts. So uh, it seems a little counterintuitive, but it almost fits perfectly with this course because that's kind of what all the questions are. So, uh, you know, getting uh, a deep knowledge on how to calculate stuff actually will end up developing that uh, conceptual understanding. Uh, now, just for an idea of what the distribution is going to be like, again, so that you know what topics to focus on, uh, this is the typical distribution. You could see that a lot of questions tend to focus on things like energy, uh, momentum, dynamics, kinematics, and rotational motion. Uh, a lot of this is because of the fact that a lot of these concepts can be intertwined together. For example, momentum questions very commonly also include energy you can easily take a dynamics question with forces and combine it with kinematics and energy as well. Uh, same thing with rotational motion. Rotational motion essentially also covers these other topics. Things like simple harmonic motion and, and uh, gravitational and centripetal forces are um, independent questions. They kind of don't really get combined with the other topics. So that's why they're not really going to be seen as often. So just keep that in mind as you're going through, you know, reviewing, going through the course, that uh, some topics are ones that you want to focus more on when you're uh, reviewing. All right, so the layout of the exam, you know, what to expect. There's going to be 50 multiple choice questions and five short uh, answer questions. Uh, of the, uh, and altogether, it's 90 minutes per section. So you're going to end up taking this test for about three hours. Now, uh, you are given a reference table to use the entire time. Uh, you're allowed to bring any approved graphing calculator. Now, one thing to point out is if you bring a calculator, you do not have to worry about wiping the memory. This is definitely very useful. Uh, but for the most part, everything's given to you uh, that you would need. Now, uh, to go into a little bit more detail about the multiple choice, uh, the multiple choice, there's a uh, each of the multiple choices will have four choices to choose from, uh, and there's two different types of them. So one of the types, the ones that you're going to see the most often, are 45 questions, single correct questions. These are your typical ones that you've seen. Only one's the correct answer. Pick the best choice. That's it. Easy enough. Uh, however, there is a difference here that there's five questions that are called multiple correct. Here, uh, there's going to be two answers that are correct and you have to get both of them in order to get the credit. So if you get one correct and one wrong, that's wrong. You have to get both answers correct, no partial credit. Um, these are always going to be at the very end. They're usually kind of set at the very end of the question. It says select two choices. It's usually very clear that these are different than the other ones. So you know, it's not like they're sprinkled in throughout the test, uh, but they are kind of a tricky bunch. Again, the when we're going through this course, you're going to see me going over these types of questions, so it won't come out uh, as that weird. Um, some very helpful tips when taking the multiple choice. Uh, like I said, many of the questions are designed to point in the wrong direction. So what I normally recommend is that you star out and you isolate whichever you're immediate first choices uh, and then don't select that reread it and see if maybe one of the other choices is a better answer 
you know, maybe see if there was something like some small phrase that you might have overlooked or something else that would make your immediate first first response wrong. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, recheck the choices and make sure that you get rid of any choice that's definitely wrong. This is not like get rid of the choices you think are wrong. Uh, when I say cross out the ones that are wrong, I mean like the ones that completely contradict what's going on uh, and you know for a fact are absolutely wrong. So just want to, like I said, uh, I'll give more examples of this as we go through uh, practice problems. Um, and then also in a lot of conceptual questions, they might not give you actual numbers, but you can actually make up numbers you uh, yourself, kind of put numbers into the problem and do some calculations and see what you get and see what happens. So again, that's why uh, learning how to uh, calculate the questions is very helpful. All right, uh, now the short answer response, uh, there's, like I said, there's five uh, short answer questions. One of them is always an experimental design question. Uh, this is where you have to design your own experiment. Um, you know, you have to kind of do the whole procedure, you know, measurement, all that type of stuff. Uh, because of that, a lot of our labs are going to be focusing on that. I'm going to be hitting really hard in labs on having you design your own procedure, writing it out, all that type of stuff. So again, by the time you take the test, you will have written out a ton of experimental designs, a ton of procedures. You should know how to write a procedure like the back of your hand. Um, there's going to be one question that's a qualitative quantitative question. Um, this is where you're going to answer the questions mathematically, but also conceptually. You, you'll see what that means, but usually this is more like the mathematical questions. Uh, and then three of them are going to be what's called short answer in the sense that um, you're going to have to write like a paragraph response of what's going on. Um, and this is where you're kind of focusing a little bit more on the conceptual aspect. Uh, this is where you're going to have to do a lot of justification, you know, things like that. So one of them is going to be calculation, one is going to be a lab, and the rest are going to be explaining what's going on. Uh, now some helpful tips. Uh, like I said, when we start talking about labs, you'll see me explaining this, but when you're doing uh, designing experiments, you have to include multiple trials. If you do not include multiple trials, you will not get the full credit. So multiple trials is something you have to include. Um, like I said, a lot of times use equations, write out calculations, and then if you're like writing a paragraph response that doesn't have calculations, basically translate what you did mathematically into words. That could be very helpful and very useful. Um, now, another thing is don't assume that the person understands what you're talking about. You kind of have to write these things as if the person uh, was never taken an AP course, may not even know what physics is. That's how you should be writing these, uh, your explanations. You kind of have to walk the person's hand along with it. You can't just assume that the person knows what you mean when you say it's in equilibrium. So you, you might have to go into a little bit of explanation. Again, all this stuff is things that we're going to practice in class. Uh, another thing that's actually kind of useful is the, uh, pay attention to the number of points that the question's worth. Uh, usually in the beginning it will say, you know, the question's worth 7 points or worth 15 points. What you can do is take the number of parts in the question, divide the points that it's worth by the number of parts, and uh, that will give you like how many points each section's worth. Uh, then what you're going to do is use that as, as a guide to figure out how much work you need. A good example is if you have a question that's worth seven points and doesn't have any, you know, part A, part B, part C, it's just a question, that requires seven statements, either seven parts of a calculation or seven claims in, in your paragraph. On the flip side, if you have um, a question that's worth eight points and there's four subparts, each section is going to be worth about two points. You need about two claims and statements. Again, either in your explanations or um, in the work that you show. So again, the amount of points you have dictates how many, how much work you have to put into answering that question. So keep that in mind um, and. 
yeah, so going back to the whole paragraph thing, that if you have a seven-point seven question that requires a paragraph response, they're basically looking for seven sentences with each one making a different uh, physical claim. So all this stuff is stuff that we're going to practice. Hopefully you, get, you have a little bit of an idea of what to expect on the EP exam. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, but as I mentioned before, we're going to be going through uh, this course, constantly revisiting this. By the time you enter the EP, you should feel at least somewhat comfortable of knowing what to expect. All right. See you later and have a great day.